Assalamu alaikum. Good afternoon. Bonjour. Ciao. Lots of nationalities on the stage, so a very warm welcome to each and every one of you. Um, a very important topic we have to discuss today, and I'll be your moderator. My name is Rebecca McLaughlin Easton. The name of the game is healthcare, and my esteemed panel are going to give us some insights, not only about the field and its advancements, but specifically with biotech. Let me introduce them to you. To my left, I'm delighted to say that we have Dr. Sara Althari. She is the Managing Director of Biotech and Pharma and an advisor to the Ministry of Investment of Saudi Arabia. Thank you for being here, Sarah. Next, we have Dr. Abdullah. He is uh, Dr. Al, Al Hawasi. How was that? Um, forgive me. Pretty close. You should see my name. It's, uh, it's difficult to pronounce. But thank you so much for being here. He's the CEO of Novo Genomics. Next, we have Sophie Smith. Delighted you could join us today, Sophie. She is the CEO and founder of Nabta Health. Very welcome. Ashish Koshi, familiar face to me as a journalist, CEO of G42 Healthcare. Very welcome. Vincenzo Vrenticelli, he is next. He is the CEO for the Middle East, Turkey, and Africa for Philips Healthcare. Thank you for being here, Vincenzo. And last, but by no means least, Julien Vidal, the CEO of Azmed. Thank you, everybody, for being with us at FII and for this important panel discussion. Let's get straight to it and address what we actually do, why we're on this stage, and what we're bringing to this conversation. Dr. Sara, tell people in the audience a little bit about your work. Is this on? OK, mm -hmm. great. Thank you so much, uh, Rebecca. And it's a pleasure to be with you all uh, amongst an esteemed group of panelists. Thanks to the organizers for inviting us to speak today on a very important topic, still very important, despite a lot of us uh, in belief that we are in the post-pandemic uh, uh, phase of, of COVID. Um, in, uh, briefly, I, am, uh, I run biotech and pharma investments in the Ministry of Investment. So on a practical <clears throat> level, what that means is that we try very hard to increase investments in this sector, biotechnology across the sort of life sciences pillars, within medical biotechnology, agricultural applications, food, materials, uh, um, and energy, uh, as, as well as in traditional pharmaceuticals. Uh, on, a, on a sort of more uh, abstract level, we consider ourselves at the Ministry of Investment ecosystem builders. And so what we try and do is plant seeds within the various sectors that we uh, conduct business development activities in, and that means you know, promoting uh, the right regulations. That means engaging with investors proactively and generating leads from around the world. It means also uh, supporting our local private sector, doing business matchmaking, leading negotiations and transactions all the way until investors are, are set up in the kingdom. Thank you. And just a quick follow-on question. How would you sum up investment appetite right now, investment climate, also for PPPs? So I think in this sector, specifically in the kingdom, we've witnessed a massive increase in appetite since COVID struck. And I guess that's one of the silver linings of the mm -hmm. pandemic. The conversation in the kingdom historically within the pharmaceutical space has revolved a lot around generics and small molecules and traditional industrial manufacturing capabilities. Right now, we are talking to companies and to uh, government stakeholders in the local private sector about technologies like genomics and cell gene therapy uh, uh, and AI and drug discovery and advanced applications. There's immense appetite for startups doing, many in, uh, doing the most innovative work to spin into universities and research centers within the kingdom. Uh, the funding appetite even across uh, generalist funds we see are, are pivoting towards uh, higher risk life science plays, both to localize within the kingdom, but to also diversify their portfolios internationally. Um, so across the board, we see increased momentum in the space. And what's more important to us is that we've seen uh, great reception from within the government across stakeholders, not just our ministry, but also the Ministry of Industry, the Ministry of Health, our regulators, in being responsive and proactive about creating a regulatory environment that is inviting to, to this increased appetite. Regulation is so important, and we will come back to it. But thank you, Dr. Sarah. Um, Dr. al Hausawi. Thank you. Um, welcome again. Tell me a little bit about what you do and tell our panel about your company. Thank you very much, uh, Rebecca. 
so actually there's no more uh, panel that is symbolic of the theme of this year's uh, FII like this panel because you know we're talking medical and, 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 and biotech. Uh, my name is Abdel Al Hausawi. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of a, a company called Novo Genomics and uh, the why of Novo Genomics basically is uh, on one hand, we've got a, a big demand uh, of uh, uh, this this field in Saudi, four to five times, uh, you know, the rate of uh, of genetic diseases in the kingdom. But the, on the other hand, the the supply side is weak, uh, and so one of the things we're we're we're, we're interested in is is to help with the localization of uh, genomics and multi-omics uh, in the kingdom, which would help uh, really promote and push forward the uh, precision medicine uh, field. Uh, you know, you talked about the appetite. Uh, you know, we, we, we've got a big appetite, you know, giving the, uh, the opportunity that we see uh, of uh, not only just promoting health and, 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 and wellness and treating diseases, but also uh, in pro uh, actually, uh, you know, leveraging that uh, to improve quality of life. So, so lots of potential opportunities coming. And if one of the obstacles or the headwinds we could say is the supply side, when do you see that improving? You know, the, the, the thing with, with genomics is uh, there, there are different stakeholders and, 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 and different challenges. So it's not just having a lab that you can, you can do the testing. Uh, uh, you know, by the year 2025, uh, we should stop seeing astronomical and we should start seeing genomical because genomics is going to be the number one uh, you know, source of big data. So you end up with, with, with gigabytes and, you know, terabytes of, of data and how you, you know, how robust your analytical platforms and storage platforms is going to be key. Yeah. So, you know, we have Misa here uh, with us on, 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 the, on, the, on the platform. I hope that uh, uh, we also would, would, would get improvement in the cloud computing space because it's ex extremely important, you know, to, to make sure that you have a, 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 a you know, kind of investment and in, uh, attractive uh, uh, field for uh, investors to actually work in in Saudi. And what a perfect forum to have those discussions, especially when the people are in the room. Perfect. Um, Sophie, thank you very much, Doctor. Let me come to you, Sophie. Thank you for joining us. Um, tell me a little bit about uh, Nabta Health. So we're a hybrid healthcare company for women. What we look at is um, reimagining clinical pathways for specific chronic diseases from pre-symptom to diagnosis. So um, we operate across the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia. I think one of the most interesting questions that we have to answer is how do you share um, incredibly complex information um, from a medical standpoint, um, from, a, from a genetic standpoint, with people who have very limited infrastructure access and education. How do you even get people who don't recognize symptoms as symptoms to, to walk themselves through clinical pathways um, to a diagnosis in the first place? So a lot of the work we do with our artificial intelligence um, and its development is, is actually at a pre-symptom stage um, because uh, with the women that we work with, even if a symptom can't be identified, usually a woman can tell you what, what health goal or problem she has. Mm. So I, I would like more energy. I'm trying to fall pregnant. Um, I'm suffering recurrent miscarriages. I, I'm depressed postpartum. And what we've done is at that stage, map symptoms back to goal, map conditions back to goal, so that we can take a woman just with a goal and support her with a, a faster time from, from symptom to diagnosis. Amazing. Thank you very much. Ashish. Tell us a little bit more about G42. Uh, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so let's start with uh, G42, the name itself. Uh, so we are Group 42. It's slightly geeky, but the name 42 is coming from the book Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, where they build a supercomputer, a large data center, and they ask the question uh, of life, universe, and everything. And for some reason, the number came 42, and that's us. We started a group trying to find solutions to that's troubling humanity. Uh, I represent the healthcare division. Uh, we are pretty young. Uh, we started three years back. Uh, today, we are 725 employees in G42 Healthcare. So we are not just an AI and cloud computing company. We have six main pillars, uh, diagnostics and omics. 
uh, Professor Abdullah has visited our place. It's, it's, it's one of the largest infrastructure for genomics. We have uh, Illumina, we have uh, BGI, we have Oxford Nanopore, all working together in, in one single roof. The total capacity of sequencing is roughly half a million genomes uh, per year. So that's our diagnostics and omics. We have UAE's first CRO. It was one of the reasons uh, UAE became one of the fastest vaccinated countries in the world. We ran, the CRO ran a, 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 a clinical trial aptly named For Humanity, and it had 45,000 volunteers in four different countries. We have a pharmaceutical and manufacturing arm where we are producing mRNA vaccines. We have a digital health pillar where I can see some partners from, uh, from the DOH. We work really closely with the Department of Health. We run the Center of Digital Health there. We have a tool called Health Site, which enables pharmaceutical companies to do cohort search. We have a solution called Malafi, which is my file. It's a health information exchange. So anybody who visits a hospital in Abu Dhabi, their data is centralized. So you picture that together with genomics, we have a huge gold mine of data which we want to invest in and eventually find that personalized cure. The last but not least, I think the pillar is, I think we just announced five days back, we've merged with another entity, it's called Mubadala Healthcare. So uh, a company that started off as in one employee and right now is around 10,000 yeah. employees uh, over last week. Uh, so that's in a nutshell what G42 does. <laughs> you give me the headlines, that's what we like. And Mabrook and Mabadala, fantastic. Fantastic news. Um, let me come to you, Vincenzo, as if we didn't know, tell us about Philips. Yes, thanks, uh, Rebecca. I'm very happy to be back to FIYI after a few years and back to Saudi after a couple of weeks. So I represent Philips uh, for Middle East, uh, Turkey, and uh, Africa. Philips is a global company with uh, meaning 130 year history um, and with the purpose uh, to improve the, well, the health and well being of billions of people through meaningful innovation. So the inno is innovation are looking at a very wide spectrum of clinical areas. Actually, we start even before. We look at uh, healthy living and prevention, and then we look at specifically at area in the precision diagnostic, uh, uh, minimally invasive uh, imaged guide therapy, monitoring, uh, remote monitoring. The interesting thing is that Philips is um, widely known uh, for uh, his cutting edge technology and equipment but since many years, is, uh, the biggest part of investment is going into informatic solution, mm -hmm. AI, machine learning, in all the clinical spaces that, we, that I, 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 uh, I talked about. So we partner with government to be part of their healthcare transformation. We partner with a private uh, entity globally to make sure that we create with them the proper roadmap to enable better delivery of care, better patient experience, better staff experience, and in the middle long term, at a better cost of care. Yes, so very important before we come back to all of those issues. Thank you very much, Vincenzo. Julien, bienvenue. Uh, let me come to you. Tell me a little bit Thank more you. about your company. With pleasure. Thank you, Rebecca. So we are a bit younger than uh, Philips. <laughs> we are four years old. we all are. <laughs> Uh, and what we do at AZMED is that we create deep learning technologies uh, that are able to detect pretty much everything that you can see and that you can spot on x-rays. And we show that to any kind of medical imaging specialist. So to radiologists, to emergency physicians, to orthopedic surgeons, for example, pretty much all around the world, so that they can secure the diagnostic for the patient to be sure that they don't miss anything that's happening on, uh, on this x-ray, on this data. And we also optimize the workflow for the doctors and for the patients. Uh, we do that because there's a huge demand as in uh, other markets in, uh, in healthcare. And we think that the, the problems, the challenges that the medical imaging market face is pretty much representative of the whole healthcare problems uh, that we can see and that we can spark today. So those solution has been commercialized since three years and we are already using uh, more than 500 locations in 25 countries. And we think it's, uh, uh, this market is going really fast because there's a huge need in uh, those solutions today. Um, and I think that would be also a, a good way to get back on how all those solutions today can uh, face 
global healthcare problems today. Well, I'll ask you that exact question then. How can they, and when it comes to integrating these technologies at scale to really make an impact globally to patient care, what's the answer? Well, just based on our experience, the, the main solution that we found is through personalizing technology for each environment and each healthcare institution. Um, to make you understand that, I can give you a concrete example. Um, if you take one solution, one uh, software solution, one deep learning, machine learning, computer vi vision solution, whatever you want, you put that single solution in production in, let's say, three different hospitals. Uh, you put that in Riyadh, in uh, New York, in Paris, three different hospitals. You can be sure that this single solution will have performances that would be tremendously different from one hospital to another, depending on the machines they use, the patients they treat, or the habits they have. If you have more children in one hospital, more types of one abnormality, one pathology in another hospitals, this single solution will behave differently. So the most difficult part in what we do is that we don't create one single algorithm, but we create hundreds of them that respond to the exact same question. And the differences between all the solution is that they vary depending on the, the use case, they vary depending on the habits of the doctors, or uh, depending on hundreds of parameters. By doing that, you're allowing your solutions to fit exactly to the environment of each hospital. And it's very hard to do so. For our experience, at the beginning, we took six months to adapt one solution to a hospital, because every time you have one partnership, you have to start from the beginning. Now it takes a few days, obviously, because you can automate a, a lot of that. But what we see in the, the um, resolution of this problem is called domain adaptation. Mm -hmm when you adapt to every domain, to every environment, that's the best way to scale this technology with the same level of performance. Thank you very much. From small acorns, mighty oak trees grow, so they say. Six months today, six days tomorrow. Uh, Vincenzo, let me come back to you. I'm aware that we're, we're limited on time, so I want to get to all of you. Um, Vincenzo, in terms of the, the biggest technological leap or the biggest impact that Philips wishes to have on global healthcare, in the next five years, let's say, what might that be? Look, um, through smart technologies, eh, so uh, powered by AI and uh, machine learning pre and predictive analytics, I think these are the core of all innovation. And of course, the fellow panelists are all into this, um, this, uh, this field. Um, the, what we want to do is to make sure that we create concrete impact yeah, mm -hmm. from big data to insight that can be used by medical, by professionals, in order to prioritize qualitative type of job. And let me make uh, to you some examples, so in the hospital and outside the hospital. So these uh, type of solution can free up time for the uh, for staff, medical staff, to remove from their daily tasks the routinary and bureaucratic, and therefore centralize on the patient give back time to quality care. This is one element. The one that is, um, and this can be developed further, the one that, that is um, quite mature and need to be scaled is in the ability of these smart technologies to improve the access and the quality of care um, based on the ability to create a standardized way of working uh, to help um, professionals in taking more advised information. And let me make an example that is very, very relevant, for instance, for, for Saudi. Um, we have, um, since in the last couple of years, developed with um, a private chain, Al Muassad, the first tele-ICU AI enabled in the kingdom. Mm. So you need to imagine this tele-ICU, you can imagine of a command center, a cockpit, where a central hospital, where you have your best intensivist, can be connected to 50 to 100, or from 50 to 150 beds, anywhere in the kingdom or globally, potentially, through technology. So the patients are monitored at the bedside, all the vital signs, and through 
algorithm and AI, the most critical are prioritized. So the intensivist in the central command center can see exactly what are the most critical, prioritized, and follow. So this is one example, example of how this kind of technology can make an impact, is making an impact. The challenge is how we scale it further. Mm. So how this solution to have a broader impact are scaled. And in that, I think developing ecosystem and partnership and infrastructure for scalability is the challenge that we have, all of us. Absolutely. Well, that neatly brings me to you, Ashish, because scalability, going global, expanding, it's all on your uh, business plan. It's on the horizon for you. So what's the biggest challenge or headwind facing your business in that respect? So considering the, you know, the diversity of the business that we are in, each of the business units have multiple challenges. I know Abdullah mentioned about the genomics challenges mm -hmm. that we have in terms of getting the right reagents on time. Uh, there is an entire shortage. Uh, uh, we look at from a CRO perspective, how do you shorten the turnaround time using uh, health tech solutions to bring in pharmaceutical products? But if you have to look at the topic of the day is, you know, how does med tech and biotech heal the world and uh, what are the challenges there? I think the fundamental challenge is data and sharing. Mm -hmm. How do you share data across geographical borders for the betterment of humanity and for to find the right cure there? We, for example, uh, we, we run the Emirati Genome Program in, in Abu Dhabi. We've sequenced roughly around 300,000 human genomes. We want to open it to the world, but we want to open it to the world where it's mutual so that together we can find a solution there. But I feel that uh, aspect of data sharing across political slash geographical borders uh, is not there, and it has to come in. We've learned from COVID how quickly mRNA vaccines are coming when everyone came together, yeah. wanted to put all forces together, find the solution. If you want to invest in humanity and find and or heal the world, that's the only way forward. And that would also allow us to expand globally. <laughs> Naturally, yes. Thank you. Um, Sarah, controversially, how can medtech and, and uh, biotech not heal the world, let's say? So I think um, the medtech and biotech innovations will never hear a heal a world in which people do not have the capacity in terms of public health policies, in terms of uh, industry support to live well. Um, if you look at the majority disease burden today, it's not acute, it's chronic, 70%. Of, dis of, of deaths every year due to chronic disease. And chronic diseases are not managed in facilities. If you are building medtech and biotech solutions that are facility-based, you're not preventative care, you're reactive. Yeah. You're, you're intervention-oriented. And so um, where medtech and biotech must exist is in the home and in the workplace and on the person and where prevention can, can really be impactful. But then you have questions around data sharing, around interoperability, around uptake uh, and willingness among existing healthcare providers to integrate with and support these very consumer-centric solutions. Um, I think if we, where we will not heal the world with medtech and biotech is where we do not allow things to become decentralized and patient-led at a technological and at a data level. Thank you so much. Um, Abdullah, I'm perfectly coming to you when it comes to personalized medicine, curated medicine. Um, what are the challenges there and how can we overcome them quickly? Absolutely. You know, uh, just given the, the title of this panel, uh, it's important to, to look at the WHO's definition of health, mm. which is a state of a complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. I think it's, it's extremely important to, to, to look at it from that perspective. We in, in, in modern medicine have concentrated most of the resources and efforts on curative healthcare. And I'm glad that Sarah mentioned yeah. preventative and, and, and uh, promotive healthcare. So uh, I'll, I'll give you a quick example. The number one killer, uh, not just in this country, but globally is cardiovascular diseases. Uh, why is it that we have healthcare systems that wait until people end up with with a heart attack, you know, wait until they end up with 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 high, you know, uh, risk factors of cardiac diseases, when we can do uh, screening for for those uh, upstream? So the beauty of of of, of genomics, uh, I believe, and 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 I think we're very, you know, kind of few years away from 
a, a time where newborns are going to go home with their whole genome sequenced. Right. And then we can put them on a, on a personalized wellness plan. So why wait until people get diseases where we can actually do that? It's going to get traction with, with policymakers because actually you're saving money when you wait uh, and, until someone has symptoms. It's actually more expensive, and, and, and the outcome is not as good when, uh, you know, uh, if, you, if you know your, 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 your genome and your microbiome, which is extremely important. You know, think about what we can do uh, pushing this forward. So that's, that's one, uh, one of the areas as a, as a practicing clinician, actually, you know, I, 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 I'm just so excited about the future of, of healthcare and how we can push it forward. When do you envisage that happening? What will be a potential timeline on that? Uh, I can, you know, I, I think over the next decade we, we would definitely have some, some uh, you know, big changes in uh, screening, for example, of some of the cancers. There's liquid biopsy where you can actually do uh, screening early on for, for certain cancers. Why, why do women have to wait until, you know, they, they get uh, screening mammography or get clon colonoscopy for colon cancer? When, when you can do it with, the, you know, with a blood sample that can screen for, you know, dozens of, of, of uh, cancers. Mm -hmm. So I think the area, you know, watch the space of, uh, of precision oncology, you know, watch the space of what ha what's going to happen in cardiovascular. If we can, we must. The future is, uh, the future is bright, we hope. Dr. Sarah, so many topics to cover with you. But um, in, in terms of what we've been talking about with data and uh, being shared across borders and also being less reactive, more preventative, what's your take on this? So I think I just want to echo a lot of the sentiments that the panelists have already expressed and that uh, you know we heard the word proactive a number of times. And I think that's really key. We need to be proactive, we need to move at the pace of innovation, we need to be future oriented, and where we can, and this is our perspective as a government, is try and leapfrog legacy systems where we feel where there is a competitive edge and a competitive advantage. You know, uh, Dr. Abdelilah mentioned s sequencing newborn babies. There is a project out of Boston that I'm sure you know called BabySeq that was established by Dr. Robert Green that is already piloting this concept, right? And it comes with a lot of technical, regulatory, and ethical questions. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that, you know, we want to get to a stage uh, back in, in, in sort of the days I was still in the laboratory, we were designing high throughput assays that allow you to get a readout of every single mutation that could potentially occur in a possible gene and create sort of an atlas or a map for clinicians to be able to look that up like a spreadsheet and when they read your sequencing data, be able to make uh, calculated uh, risk assessments of your predisposition to, for example, type 2 diabetes or uh, uh, common complex diseases or monogenic sort of uh, uh, genetics-based diseases. And, um, and so I think the future is really in those applications. The future is in, the future of treatment is definitely in precision medicine. The future of medicine in general, I think, is in, is in prevention. And so as we optimize these platform technologies, as we optimize digital platforms and the way we handle and share and manage data, we'll be able to make more intelligent and knowledge-based assessments and, and forecasts and predictions, and therefore optimize the sort of prevention engine of, of medicine. And I think as we do that, uh, we'll have fewer and fewer people suffering from disease that we are forced to treat only in a reactive way, mm -hmm. uh, and those subset of people that become ill can then be treated hopefully by personalized treatments and, and, and precision medicine that is very targeted uh, to, to their disease profile. Um, and uh, in order for us to be able to do that at scale, governments need to respond with uh, progressive uh, regulatory reform that strikes a very fine balance between, you know, national interests, national security, uh, the security of patients, the anonymization of data, how do you de-anonymize it to unlock the value, and so we think about a lot of these questions and we analyze the different models that have worked in some places and that haven't worked in others and try and find the right fit for uh, the pace of innovation and the types of activities that we want to introduce, at least in the kingdom's healthcare and biotech ecosystem. Thank you. And outside of the region, of course, we would very much hope that this is healthcare for all, that this is a future that will be rolled out. There is equity in uh, medtech and biotech across the world. We are rapidly running out of time. So let me come very quickly to each of you. 
the final day at FII, another fantastic edition, um, the seventh, Investing in Humanity. What a fantastic uh, conversation to end my time at FII uh, this time around in Saudi on. Um, Dr. Sarah, your key takeaway, what interesting conversations have you had on the ground or what surprised you the most? Uh, so we get surprised every day, right, by young founders in the space, by entrepreneurs, by people thinking about biotech at the intersection of, of other sectors. So the applications that we hear at the intersection of AI and data and, and, and blockchain applications even and Web3 and how all of these sort of cutting edge innovations that are rapidly advancing, uh, complementing biotech and, and hopefully allowing us to approach a future where preventative medicine is much closer. We share your wish. Thank you. Dr. Avlilala, what are you thinking? Um, I, I think, you know, the energy that you feel over the past uh, three days, the energy that you feel in Saudi, and I, I'm t I can tell you this as a Saudi, is just going up and up. You know, this is, this is a very proud country. This is a very upbeat and optimistic country. Uh, you know, we, we're, 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 we're becoming more attractive to, to uh, you know, foreign investment uh, with, with, uh, with also the, 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 the government platforms, etc. Uh, I think the future, which we saw in that my, uh, the, the priority report, it shows that our country, the majority of people actually think that tomorrow is going to be better than today. So we're, 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 we're very optimistic, you know, uh, high, high energy and, uh, you know, uh, looking forward. Thank you. High energy from you, Sophie. Closing thought on FII. Yeah, I, th I think that I expected the high energy. Um, was always, is, I'm always pleasantly surprised by it. The, um, the energy and attention that is specifically focused on establishing Saudi Arabia as a hub for research and development has been a very pleasant surprise. We were one of the first, I think we're still one of the only health tech companies out of the UAE that does local R&D, but if we ever want to address health inequity in the world, we have to orient more and more research and development in the Middle East, Africa, and South Asia, where uh, markets that have been historically underserved. So the energy specifically with a focus on R&D has been fantastic. Thank you. Ashish, you're no stranger to Saudi. It's good to be here and good to be back at FII. Your, your closing thoughts. Yeah, so I'm, I'm coming back to Saudi after a number of years, <laughs> uh, 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 as opposed to uh, what, uh, what Sophie said, uh, ec you expected high energy. I did not expect this kind of energy, but this is incredible. As a company that grew uh, over three years, building partnerships, uh, I see a wonderful potential in, in, in such a a vehicle that's created here to find partners. And we found, I've had interesting conversations across the ecosystem, be it from genomics, be it from cloud, be it from a CRO perspective on just, and I just came back from the longevity uh, talk also there. I think this FII is here to stay and uh, it is definitely something that I look forward uh, to find uh, new partners so that we can take, take to the world together. Thank you. Vincenzo, FII, good for business, good for partnerships, but good for humanity, we hope. <laughs> good for many things. Yeah. But I think it reflects the energy, the passion, and the vision of the country. Yeah, the country is really open, opening. And what I really love of, of, of this country is a compelling vision, but the ability to make things happen. Mm. If I think of some of my most transformative and um, innovative solutions, are happening here now so and this is what i feel yeah i'm very grateful thank you julian the last word with you everything hangs on what you're about to tell us tremendous energy <laughs> energy no really we have the chance in our company to be supported by uh, fii and we were amazed to see uh, back then the way they understood the problem we are trying to solve and uh, the challenges of the, the market we're in. We were really amazed by that. And when I come to the conference, I understand it's not just FII, but the, the whole region uh, with which we are able to, to make business and to uh, have a, a progress in uh, healthcare, biotech, and medtech uh, environments today. So that, that's really great to see that in person. Thank you, and we wish all of you continued success in such an important and uh, admirable field. Uh, we all need great health, so uh, please join me in thanking my esteemed guests for their contribution here today.